Well, good morning, church family. How are you today? It is a glorious day, isn't it? Would you pray with me, Father? Again, we are just so filled with joy to worship you as our creator, God. We thank you for the creative power that you have to make us new every day. So, Father, as we open your word today, may we remember it is your word. Anoint our ears that we may hear the voice of your spirit. And, Father, I just want to surrender all of these words to you, that you may do with them what you do to make them clear, to make them simple, that we may understand them. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So, many years ago, I co-directed a, a play. And in that play, we had about 26 young people. And it was a musical. How many of you remember musicals? Oh, yeah, they're still pretty good. So, one thing that was really important was helping the young people realize that when they're speaking, if it sounds like you're speaking too loud, it's just about right for everyone else to hear. So we're going to practice that. It goes like this. I want to hear you say amen. amen. Oh, that is, that's really good. That is really good. That's good projection. Now, do you think we could do it so that everyone in the back row could hear it bouncing off the wall? Now, don't, don't, hold on just a moment. Jesus loves you. Amen. Oh, that, see, that just changes everything, doesn't it? You see, when we come to worship, we come to worship God. Do you believe that is true? Amen. And how we worship is determined by how we view who God is. We are going to look at who Jesus is today. Because it impacts our worship and how we worship. Amen? So we're going to go on this journey. These are not always the easiest texts. They are not maybe the most popular ones. They may not be the ones you memorize the most. But it is my prayer that you will never forget them Amen. the rest of your life. Because they are God's word. Amen. And that's why we're here today. So let's go on this journey. And uh, Maria is going to be running the slides from the back. All right. So let's see what comes up when we go to the next slide. Let's talk about who Jesus is. And it's moved. There we go. Now... When we look at Jesus in the middle of our world, the challenge we have is understanding how does he fit in? How does he fit into the life of your neighbor? How does he fit into the people that you can't hardly stand? How does Jesus fit into your children? Some of you may have children who do not attend church. And there's something about the story of Jesus that has caused them maybe to take a left or a right turn and move away from the church. If we're going to share Jesus with the world, what is his true purpose to be here? So let's look at Matthew 1, 21 and 22. You're familiar with this one. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from what? So I've got to ask you a question. Who are Jesus' people? Is it limited just to this room? Is it as big as the planet itself? So, if we really believe that is true, then Jesus came to save the people that we may not think of being worthy. He came to save them as well. Amen. Do you believe that is true? Amen. So, Jesus is bigger than my picture. He is bigger than your picture. His picture is a global picture. Amen. That's right. So, if you took it opportunity to look at our Sabbath school lesson, could you add to your prayer experience for revival 
for a global picture, Jesus' picture of what he sees as a planet. Amen. Pray for a bigger picture. Amen. Because we will see that in these passages this morning. Let's go on to the next one. John 3, 17, For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Why did Jesus come? Save the world. He came that the world might be saved by all of their good behavior. And you know that isn't true, don't you? He came that the world might be saved how? Through him. How many saviors are there in your life? Now just pause for a moment here and think. How many saviors are there in your life? You can best answer that question by thinking about the list that only you know about of the things that you know that you do to get God's attention so he will notice you. For some, that list might look like a list of really good things you've done. It might look like a list of promises you've negotiated with God. But if there is any kind of a list at all, it may be that you have at least two saviors, you being one of them. Have mercy is right. Because you see, the Bible teaches there's only one Savior. And he didn't ask for a co-Savior. And that means that if, if you feel a need to help save someone else in the church, there may be a person that has another Savior they don't even know about because it might be you. But did God send you in the world to save it? No, he did not. He sent Jesus into the world that the world might be saved through him. Amen? Amen. That's good news, isn't it? All right. Let's go on to the next one. Timothy 1, 15 and 16 is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ came into the world to save sinners among whom, Paul wrote, I am foremost. Now, we're going to talk about Paul for just a moment here, not Pastor Paul. You're blessed to have Pastor Paul. We're talking about Pastor Paul in the New Testament. And we'll just stay with that all the rest of the way through the sermon, okay? Amen. But you know, this might be true about Pastor Paul too. And I hope it's true about me, but I also hope it's true about you. You see, Paul discovered something about the Holy Spirit, and when the Holy Spirit moved into Paul's life, it gave him a revelation of the truth of himself. That nobody else knew until he started writing his letters. And in the letters Paul wrote, you begin to get a glimpse of what the Holy Spirit revealed to him personally. And this is one of those aha moments that Paul is not trying to make something up. He's not trying to pretend. He is a mature. He is a converted. He is a, an evangelist. He is a mature Christian who walks with Jesus every day, centuries ago. And listen to what he wrote. Right at the end of that verse... Among whom I am foremost of all. Which means Paul, not pretending, writing a personal letter to Timothy, said, I am a foremost sinner. Now the challenge with scripture is, is how do we take this book and how do we then apply it to ourselves? If you take this verse and say, Lord, what does this verse say is the truth of me? Not me, you. What does it say? Have you had that encounter, that moment with the Holy Spirit in which the Holy Spirit gives you an honest revelation about the truth of your own human heart and your need of Jesus Christ? 
Because you see, it doesn't matter how many years you've been to church and how many things you have done for the Lord or how many sermons or how many evangelistic series you have preached. Do you know that you're a sinner in need of the precious blood of Jesus Christ? And Paul, in a moment writing to this young pastor, who by the way wasn't as young as we might think, wants him to understand that this is the truth of Paul and it is the truth of every church leader and every church member that we are as much in need of the precious saving power of Jesus as every person that lives in every house around this church and that's an important discovery let's move on our next slide Sin is a universal human problem. I have not recently heard of anybody who was just suddenly translated that rose up from the earth and went right into the presence of God because they had already gotten complete victory over sin. Now, you may know somebody that did. I don't. It is a universal sin problem. Sin is a problem with our flesh. It is more than just our bad behavior. Let me explain what I mean by that. There is the sin that we do. We know when we do it. I won't use anything like taxes, you know, that wouldn't be fair, would it? Hmm. I won't talk about how we drive on the freeway, that wouldn't be right either. You know, there are just things we do. And we know what they are, and we know that they're not right. And they're just actions that happen in our life, and we know it because we just wished it had never happened in the moment. You know what I'm talking about? But you see, there's another word for sin, and that is harmortano, which is sin as a thing. And what is a thing in English when you're writing? A person, place, or thing is what? It's a noun. There is this thing called sin. And this thing called sin is in our flesh. It's in us. It's natural to us. We may even be uncomfortable, but we still pursue it and we still do it because it's here in us. And it's a universal problem with all of humanity. Let's go on to the next slide. The Bible says this about this particular problem. For all of us have become like one who is unclean, and all of our righteous deeds are like filthy garments, and all of us wither like a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind take us away. That's what this thing called sin does. And I don't care how well you know Jesus. It's still there. Because we're human beings. It's a human problem. So there's never going to be a moment we don't need the precious blood of Jesus, is there? Let's continue. Romans 7, 18 and 19 says, For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh, for the willing is present in me, but the doing of the good is not in me. Again, there are some people who say, well, Paul's just using a metaphor. I'm going to tell you the context of this letter is written by a mature, understanding, honest Christian man that is not making something up and pretending to say something to make you want to do something. Paul was not that manipulative, I'm sorry. He was a man that had incredible say impeccable integrity with God and what is he saying is the truth of himself that the ability to do good does not naturally dwell within him is it different for you and me so we do understand this truth that exists within the context of the human race. And we have discussed why it is Jesus has come. He has come to save us from this very thing. Let's go on to the next slide. 
Can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots? Then you cannot do good who are accustomed to doing evil. Okay. I have a question for you. What color is my skin? What color is it? There's some indecision here. Okay, I, I made some discoveries about my ancestors. I used to think I was a Scotch-Irish person of history, but I discovered that the Patricks on the mother side of the family were actually Scotch as well. So it turns out I'm Scotch and Scotch. I don't know what to say about that. Hasn't changed me a whole lot just yet. But I also discovered that Abraham Diamond was one of my great-grandfathers, was a great or great-great. And Abraham Diamond comes from a different part of the world. Uh, Gus Davis Adolphus McCandless was my grandfather named after the Protestant king of Sweden in the 17th century, and I have no idea why. So what, what color do you think I am? Now just on the outward appearance, it's pretty obvious, isn't it? I'm gray. Mostly. Somebody actually gave the right answer when they said, you're red. You see, we can't change our external sin color. Well, I take that back. Um, Anglo people have color envy. And they go sit on the beach all day so they can get color. You didn't get that. <laughs> Okay, we're going to just let that one go right on by. Okay, now you got it. All right, it wasn't intended. It was actually a fact. Okay, it wasn't. Okay. I can't change my skin color, can I? But what does Jesus do? He changes the color on the inside. And he makes us red in the blood of the Lamb. That's what Jesus does. Let's continue. Next slide, please. Jeremiah 17, 9, The human heart is the most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. Who really knows how bad it is? And all you need to do, if you want to know, is just listen to the news. A lot of ugly things are going on in this world right now, aren't they? None of them are pleasant. We're still discovering how evil the heart is on this planet. Next slide. Romans 8, 1 to 5, now getting to our scripture reading. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ has already set you free from the law of sin and death. Did you have a great 4th of July? Did you have a good one? Barbecued the fatted calf and Loma Linda, of course, makes fatted calf, don't they? Okay. Fireworks, did you celebrate freedom? Amen. Are you here today because of this text? That there has been something that Jesus has done that, and I'll read it to you again, verse 2, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ, Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. Do you, do you have freedom today? Do you have freedom to think things you did not think before? To see directions you have not seen before? To let God implant in you things that never occurred to you before? Are you experiencing and celebrating in your acts of worship today the freedom that you have because Christ has set you free from the law of sin and death? In fact, there's so much joy and it's overflowing and effervescent in your life that you can't wait to get out the doors of this church so you can come alongside the lives of people around you and that'll just bubble over right on top of them. Amen. Amen. We stepped out in faith about 2011 and we 
took an early retirement package and started a little company, as you know, called Screaming Rock Media, which is a ministry. We've been shooting film now, and we've got just a little over 30 hours for our documentary that we have to kind of shrink that down to about uh, 60 to 120 minutes. It's not going to be easy, so we have someone else doing the editing because it's way too personal for us. And we set up our editing up in Washington here just a week or so ago. And in the interviews that we have done, the people that we have met, we have watched how God has surrounded them with not just us, but with a group of individuals. And we have seen them, listen carefully, get up and walk in to Seventh-day Adventist churches because they wanted to. Because the people that surrounded them didn't come to tell them how to think and how to act and how to live. They came alongside of them. And they wanted. There'll be a picture you'll see of a young lady who has been to the Adventist church on two occasions. First time in her whole life. She's 15 years old. She just sent an email and says, I want to be baptized in the Adventist church. No Bible studies. She just knows this is where home is to her. Amen. Because God just came alongside and set her free. I wish I, could, I wish I could play a portion of the interview. I actually went looking for it and realized all the hard drives that have that particular clip on them are sitting back on the desk at home. And I can't show them to you this time. Maybe another time I can just sit down and let you listen to the stories. We've interviewed people who are agnostics. And you know what they've said? You know, we're still waiting to be convinced. They know there's a God out there. But the one that they were given in their whole life growing up in their churches and their schools and their education, the ones they grew up with, the, the picture of God that was given to them was so heavy and so burdensome. They walked away from church. And I'm not talking about the Seventh-day Adventist church, though I've got those stories too. I'm talking about other people from other churches. There is just a picture of Jesus that's out there that just doesn't tell the real story and people are walking away but listen carefully they're not walking away from God they're searching and they're looking and when they meet someone who will come alongside and not judge them who will listen to them who will just be gracious and kind the Holy Spirit takes over and moves them out of their comfort zone and that can be your experience if you understand and experience this freedom in Christ first. Amen. That you are free to come along anyone, I'm going to say it carefully now, I don't want you to miss this, of any color, of any religion, Amen. Muslim, Hindu, outright paganism, it does not matter. I had an opportunity to work with the whole crew from Burning Man. How many of you know what Burning Man is? Hold up your hands. Don't be bashful. I didn't ask who went. Okay. But I've seen those kids. They're just, you know, they're awesome people. They're talented. They're smart. And they said, well, you know, we're pretty scary. You know, we got tattoos. I mean, they have tattoos. But you know what? They're just amazing young people and there's no reason to be afraid of them they just needed someone to come alongside and be nice and to be kind and to be thoughtful you see you have the freedom when you were set free from the law of sin and death do you know that you were set free of all prejudicial issues inside of your heart Amen. there's a huge issue going on right now over whether same-sex couples should marry it is huge in America. And I've got so many friends in the church who are getting caught in this issue and they're missing the whole point. 
because they do not hear their voices uttering their hatred of these people. They're just people that need Jesus. Amen. Just like me and just like you. Amen. But we can't sit back and throw rocks at them and then go tell them how much God loves them. Can we? You see, we get caught up in the political side of it. And that excuses us from having to care about their heart. Because that's what politics does. It alienates and it divides and it separates. But Jesus has set us free so that we can move towards the entire human race in Christ Jesus to every single person on this planet that we're told will hear the gospel as it is in Jesus. And we can't do it bathed in prejudicial attitude. Can we? Because Jesus has already set you free from all the prejudice in your life. Have you accepted that gift from him today? So that you're free to walk into any neighborhood, anywhere, anytime, and tell them the good news. Because we have been set free from the law of sin and death. Let's continue. Next slide. Therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. To be in Christ, first of all, means you have no condemnation. Now, where do you get the most condemnation from? Say it loud. Where do you get most con Somebody went like this. Where do you get most... It comes from in here, doesn't it? So if you have no condemnation, and that is referring from, to the throne room of God, if you have no condemnation in the throne room of God, Ephesians 2, 6, if you have no condemnation there, then how can you use self-condemnation here? That's what it is. So I have to tell you today that you're going to need to do something for me, and that is to surrender your self-condemnation because Jesus has taken it away. I want to talk to every teenager in here. It's a tough world out there for teenagers, you know that? There are so many things pulling them so many directions and they all know that none of them are going to be good enough and, and all I'm going to say is, you know, Jesus has taken away all that self-condemnation and you're not allowed to beat yourself up because Jesus is going to love you even if you do. But he set you free from it. So there is no condemnation. Number two, you have freedom from this thing called the law of sin and death that is in you. Amen? Let's go to the next slide. How does Jesus solve the sin problem? For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh. Remember I said sin is in the flesh and it's weak? Okay. What the law could not do, weak as it was through our flesh, God did, um, please note, now here's the resolution. This is what God did to solve the sin problem. Sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. Amen. Jesus has won the victory over the flesh. In his flesh, he won the victory and defeated it, both the second death and the sin. So then why do you still have problem with sin? Because you're a human being and you have a real nature. Okay? And you're going to have that nature till the day you leave this planet or enter the grave. But I want you to know that Jesus Christ came in the likeness of sinful flesh and has won the victory. And what do you suppose Jesus is offering to the planet Earth? He's offering, listen carefully, His perfect victory. Amen. That He has won for you. 
So if you keep trying to fix yourself as a co-savior, you're going to have the most exhausting religion on the face of the earth. You're going to be tired, people. You're going to be so tired you can't tell anybody the good news. But if you've accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, then you have accepted his victory over the flesh. Is that your reality today? Is that good news today? The best news may be in the entire world. Let's go on to the next slide. There's the young lady I was talking about earlier. Stained glass window in the church up in Haley in Ketchum, Idaho. Sun Valley is what it's called. I want to read you the text on the left side, in the blue. My left, it says, and it's yours. But I see a different law in the members of my body waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner to the law of sin, which is in my members, and my members is my flesh. Right? It's my body. Okay? But I want you to go to Isaiah 53, verse 6, as a contrast to that. Isaiah wrote, all of us like sheep have gone astray, each one of us has turned his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. Amen. Did you catch that? Yes. That every single failure, every shortcoming, every time you've missed the mark, everything that is in you that you have come up short has fallen on Jesus Christ, on Him. Amen. Will you let Him have all of that stuff Amen. and stop trying to hang on to it? I know it does work for you. I know it makes you feel that if you can just get a little better, you'll feel better about yourself, but it's not true. Trying a little harder doesn't make you a little better. You're still just the same. But it said that God had to do something radical and so he took our iniquities and let them fall all on Jesus Christ. Will you let him have all of your iniquities? Amen. Isn't that simple? This is not complicated theology. Who will set me free from the body of this death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's who won was Jesus. He has won already the battle. And if we can instill this in our children from their earliest age to the end of their life, friends, they will grow up loving Jesus. They will have a radically different view of the church when they become adults. Let's move on to the next slide. God did, who won, it says at the top, God did sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and as an offering for sin he condemned sin in the flesh I want you to pay attention this is big print so we don't miss it so that the requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh but walk according to the spirit all oh, these are easy words to say they're easy, they just flow right off my lips. But what about the reality? Doesn't that change everything? You just have an aha moment and say, whoa, if all this is already reality in God's throne room, then how do I walk by the Spirit? How do I walk by the Spirit? Well, you're going to have to let a lot of stuff go. All of it. Amen. And just say, Lord, here I am. Take it all. Amen. Search me, O God, and see if there's any wickedness. Is one translation. I love another one. A newer translation goes, Search me, O God, this is Psalms 51, and see if there's any unkindness in me. Amen. Just take it away. Amen. And if you'll take it away, I'll tell the whole world the good news, is how David said it in Psalms 51. But are you ready for him to take it all away? Or do you still let it kind of nurse you through your sorrow every day? Or would you like to just let it go? And then walk by the Spirit. 
And that means a whole new conversation. That lesson we had today is a study about developing a whole new kind of dialogue with God. Amen. An inclusive dialogue. Not telling God what he's supposed to do. We're good at that. I know I had five sisters. They're still good at that. But it's about letting God have the freedom to do what he's already accomplished for you and for me inside of here. Are you willing to let him have free reign as King of Kings and Lord of Lords? Amen. Of everything in your life. Everything. That's good news. Yes, it is. So the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. That word walk is not this word. This is, this is the English version of the word walk. But in the Greek, that word does not mean to do this. That word walk is the word we would normally interpret as live. You see, it's the walk of an entire life. See, if you're, if you're going to live in the Spirit or walk in according to the Spirit, it isn't just a walking prayer, it's a living experience. It's an experimental religion. Another term would be an experiential religion. It is a happening religion that is ever-present right in front of you moment by moment. It is not something that is going to be predictable and controlled. It is something in which you're giving God the free reign to do with your life what he wants to do with it. Amen. That you give it all to him and let him give it back to you covered with his mercy, covered with his grace and his unconditional love for the human race. And he's going to pour that back in the way you live your life and you will have a radical paradigm shift in how you see humanity on this planet. And you're not going to focus on ethnicity. You're not going to focus on behavior. You're not going to focus on all of the social issues. The only thing I will guarantee you that you will care about is that every human on this planet, Jesus, has died for them and paid the penalty of their sin. And that's how you will see the world. There will no longer be, as Paul put it in Galatians 3, no longer male nor female. No longer rich or poor. Mm -hmm. No longer Greek or Jew. No longer an ethnic issue existing. No longer gender issues existing. And no longer social economic issues. When you live in the spirit, those things are gone. And they are gone in the church as well. Amen. You know there are no gender issues in the church today except the ones that we make up and bring into it. There's no argument over who should be ordained and who should not. Not if you believe in the Bible. There's no longer ethnic issues in the church, except the ones you and I bring into it. But we don't need to do that, do we? Not if you live and walk in the Spirit of God. All you see in this world are the people Jesus died for. Amen. When the church catches that vision, there will be a radical shift in how church is done. Amen. But that is what Jesus does when he heals the brokenness of the human heart. Let's go to the next slide, please. This is a complicated stuff. I am walking with fear and trepidation uh, on this particular slide. But I want you to pay careful attention. Because if we do not understand this, the gospel will always be tainted with our humanism. And we are free from that. On the left side in purple, it says from Colossians 2, 9 and 10, For in him, that is Jesus, all the fullness of the deity, the Godhead, dwells in bodily form. So we come down to the arrow. He says, this is why Jesus is called the Son of God. Because you see, Jesus is fully God, isn't he? Yes. Can I hear an amen, church? Amen. 
He is the Son of God. He was the seed of God, and He is the Son of God, and has the creative power demonstrated to heal and to forgive and to restore and to radically change our world view. Jesus possessed his Father's nature. Let there be no doubt about that. Amen. Because he is the Son of God. He is our Savior. Amen. Now let's move to the right side. Therefore, he had to be made like us in every respect. Hebrews 2.17 and 18. For since he himself suffered when he was tempted. Why did he suffer when he was tempted? Because he was human. Because Mary was his mother and he understood what it was to be a human being. And he was able to help those who are tempted because Jesus knows the human condition. Amen. He was called because of his mother, the son of man. And he was made like us. Listen carefully. Jesus possessed our nature but not our sin. Amen. Because if Jesus was a sinner, he himself would need a Savior. Amen. And Jesus did not need a Savior. Amen. But he had the reality of being us. Amen. So our Savior is fully God Amen. and fully man. Amen. And he knows the heart cry of you to the nth hour of your life. And understands and cares deeply about your condition. Doesn't matter what it is. He is there for you. That's who Jesus is. But that's just the beginning of the story. It isn't the end of the story. Let's move on. What happened at the incarnation? When Jesus was in the garden, when he sweat blood, what happened to Jesus? When he was there praying and the disciples couldn't stay with him, they kept falling asleep and they just couldn't give him support. Their humanity was too weak. He assumed our sins on himself, the sins of the flesh, the noun sin, but he never participated in them. But now here's the punchline. You see that tan area up there? He assumed the sins of what? The entire world. Everyone. That's why I keep saying over and over, the person behind you, the person next door to you, the person you hate the most, Jesus has already taken his sin on himself and has paid in full the penalty. You, know, you want to know what the church is going to look like in the last moments of earth's history? It is going to be a people who see the world through the eyes of Jesus Christ. And they just need to hear the good news that Jesus has already paid in full the penalty for their sin. Can you imagine a whole church doing that? So Jesus has his father's nature, he has his human nature, but then he assumed the sins of the entire world. He did not participate in them. Let's move on. Volume 4 of the Testimonies, page 563. He, Christ, took upon himself our nature, that with his harm he might encircle the human race. Notice race is encompass of everyone, of every color on the planet. These are our pioneers talking. Listen carefully. While with his arm he grasps omnipotence, and thus he links finite man to infinite God. When Jesus, with his nature, can reach down and take in his arms the entire human race, and with his other arm reach up and embrace the throne room of God, then there is hope for the human race. Amen. 
But more than that, there is hope for your kids who aren't in church. More than that, there is hope for your kids that are in church. And there is hope for you. Because Jesus has embraced the Father while his other arm is around you personally. Amen? And what does he want to do? He wants to embrace everyone you know. And connect them with the unlimited, unconditional love of God. Wow. Let's move on. 2 Corinthians 5.21 is the text that bears this out. God made him Jesus who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf. That's the sins he assumed so that we might become self-righteous. Well then why does it come into the church, folks? That we might become the righteousness of God in Him. Whose righteousness is it? Is it ours or is it His? It is His righteousness. And it comes to you through the person of Jesus who has embraced the throne and has embraced you. And the result is, is He gives you the righteousness of God, not your righteousness. That's Phariseeism, self-righteousness. But he's giving you the righteousness of God as a gift to move your life. To move you to your knees. To have a radically different conversation with him than you've ever had before. That's the gospel. Let's move on. Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers and sisters in every respect so that he could become a merciful and faithful high priest in things relating to God to make atonement for the sins of the people. For since he himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are tempted. Jesus assumed what we are, sinners, to meet the demands of the law. He assumed this nature as ours, but it was never his nature. But he was willing to take on our sin thing on him and pay the penalty in full. Which means you today, sitting here in this room, have been set free from the law of sin and death. That you might receive the righteousness of God freely as a gift to you to claim in the name of Jesus. Wow, God loves you immensely. That's amazing news. Let's go on to the next one. 1 John 4, 13, we have seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. John 4, 42, it is no longer because of what you have said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves and know that this one is indeed the Savior of the world. Did Jesus really do it for the whole world? Then let it change our worldview and see humanity from a radically new perspective, not according to lifestyle, not according to economic and social issues, not according to gender. Let us see through the eyes of Jesus a redeemed world and embrace people gently because they belong to him and love them and walk alongside of them because Jesus loves them irregardless of who they are. Let's continue. By his perfect life he met the demands of the law, obey and live. By his death as the sacrificial lamb, he met the demand of the law, disobey and die. By his act of redeeming us, he has forever become our righteousness. Romans 10.4, for Christ is the fulfillment of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. You see that word end up there? Teleos means It's made whole like a contract. When you pay off the mortgage on the house, it's the end of the mortgage. Mm -hmm. When Christ is the end of the law, it's because 
the contract of the law has been fully met and it's now canceled and replaced with Jesus who was the full living evidence of what the law was of love to God and love to your neighbor and everything that entails is in Christ the righteousness gifted to you are you recipients of that gift today Let's go to the next slide. When you accept Jesus as the only, and I like the word only up there, because it helps me remember I'm not able to help him. When you accept Jesus as the only Savior, a personal Savior, God sees you as complete in Jesus. Are you ready to handle this? Do you think, church, you can handle this? Do you think you can handle how God sees you today before you leave this room? Because this is startling. It says, and in Him, that's Christ, you have been made complete. Not by your cooperation. It is that you have accepted what He has completed and it is now integrated in as you. But it's His righteousness. And you are complete how? In Jesus. That in Him you have been made complete and He is the head over all rule and authority. Is Jesus King of kings and Lord of lords over everything in your life. Amen. That is the best news. Your completeness is not in your checklist of how many good and how many bad. Your completeness is in your reception of Jesus Christ. Because He is the only good. He is the only righteousness. And your completeness is in Jesus. Do you have Jesus today? Amen. Let's go to the next slide. This is our last one. The final issue will be this. The final issue, this may surprise you, is not going to be over who's got the right Sabbath. The final issue is not going to be who's got the right understanding of the nature of man. The right, I'm sorry, the final issue will be this. Do you believe that Jesus can make you complete as the Bible says in him which by the way happens to include the right day desire of ages page 113 our pioneers understood this better than we realize God spoke to Jesus as our representative with all our sins and weaknesses we're not cast aside as worthless he has made us accepted in the beloved, Ephesians 1, 6. The glory that rests upon Christ is a pledge of the love of God for us. Amen. Are you going to accept Christ in a way today that allows him to make you in the presence of the throne room of God complete in him? And let all the baggage go and rest in Jesus Christ by faith alone. That was the revival that began to stir in this church. And it has risen and fallen over the years, but it still is waiting to take hold in a congregation. Will it be this one? Will you embrace Jesus today as Lord and Savior? It's time for our closing song.